It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. Guess who this is? Right, it's Douglas Coleman. How are ya? We got Deanna Lorraine here today. Deanna is a conservative activist and she's a congressional candidate running in San Francisco's 12th district against Nancy Pelosi. And best of luck to Deanna. We had a nice conversation. She recently had a clean up San Francisco day. And we talk about that and talk about some politics and all kinds of stuff. She will be up first, followed by Rick Ness. Rick is one of the stars of the Discovery Channel's show Gold Rush. And Gold Rush has just started its 10th season. So that's exciting. And Rick is going to tell us all about the show and what he does and gives us a gold mining 101 lesson because I knew absolutely nothing about it. So I kind of gave him the questions of a child (laughs) inquiring about something that they knew nothing about. Then there's going to be some commercials in there. And then we've got some music. We've got Music X-Ray and Music Submit artists to play. The first artist up will be from Music X-Ray. The track is called Oh My Love. And the band is called Frantic Planet. Then it'll be followed by two tracks from Music Submit. Out of Tune by Rio Glacier, and then Shooting Star by the Como Brothers. Thank you to everyone who has been submitting on both Music X-Ray and Music Submit. We genuinely appreciate your contributions and have had lots of great music come through, and we're always very happy to play it. So, without further ado, here is Deanna Lorraine, followed by Rick Ness. Warning, the following episode deals with political and social commentary that some may find controversial. In a direct exercise of our First Amendment right to free speech, we here at the Douglas Coleman Show feel strongly that all Americans are entitled to express their political and social views. If you think that perhaps your feelings might be hurt by listening to this broadcast, then please do not listen to this show. Go to your safe space, put your fingers in your ears, and hum something to drown us out. For the rest of you, please enjoy the show. And remember, freedom means the right to peacefully disagree. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Deanna Lorraine. Hi, Deanna, how are you? Hey, I'm great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, For people that don't know who you are, you are running against Nancy Pelosi. Is that correct? That is correct. Running against the Wicked Witch of the West, (laughs) otherwise known as the political Goliath right now that is on everyone's mind. Now, she has been, I looked this up, she has been in that seat for 32 years. And has she run unopposed most of the time? Many of the time. Many of the Uh, time. She really hasn't had, yeah, a serious challenger. Uh, someone who's really given her a run for her money. I, I to this day, have not seen someone uh, really give her a run for her money and, and really, um, you know, give her a black eye, so to speak. There has been some challengers, but they've really been sort of the token Republican or the token Democrat to run against her, fully knowing that she would win. I plan to be that candidate that is going to give her a run for her money. Well, I always hate it when someone runs unopposed because I think uh, people right. have the right to, uh, you know, they should choose. They should have somebody to yes. choose. So I'm happy to hear yeah, that you are running. <laughs> happy to hear that you are running against her. You had a, I guess, just a couple of days ago, you had a big clean up San Francisco day, yeah? Yes, yes. It was so great. So on Monday morning, October 7th, I organized and led a group of volunteers who came and joined me, and we cleaned up the streets of San Francisco, um, most notably the Tenderloin area, which is uh, one of the areas that 
tend to have the most trash, needles on the ground, and homeless. Uh, you know, we see that a lot on TV. And we we cleaned for about <clears throat> three hours, and uh, a lot of us wore hazmat suits and heavy-duty gloves. We picked up a lot of trash. There were a lot of needles, you know, so we had to be really careful. Cleaned up around homeless uh, homeless tents and whatnot, and felt really productive. And this was really in direct response to Trump's comments that he recently made about San Francisco having a really serious health crisis, and we need to really do something about it. And this this really should be a uniting issue, one of those issues that no matter what side of the political aisle you're on, uh, we can unite together and work, roll up our sleeves together and fix it. Well, homelessness has got to be a bipartisan issue. I can't imagine anybody being pro-homelessness. I know, 100%. But I did throw the invitation out to everybody, and I also threw it out to Nancy Pelosi. Nancy did not show up. Democrats did not show up. It was just Republicans that did show up, just for the record. Well, she's busy trying to impeach Trump. I think she's got her plate full at this point. Her priorities are so backwards. She's focusing all her energy on trying to impeach the president of the United States, trying to divide an already very divided country, trying to focus on giving free health care to illegal immigrants, uh, focusing on what gender pronouns we should use (laughs) instead of focusing on the real problems that real Americans are dealing with every day. It's insane that people would keep electing her over and over again. Her priorities are completely backwards. So getting back to the homeless crisis. I know that San Francisco and L.A. have been making lots of news with many, Mm -hmm. many people sleeping in the streets and under the freeways and tents. What do you think is the major cause of the homeless problem in San Francisco? Well, there's not just one cause. You know, it's really uh, it's a really complex situation. One of the main causes is the extremely high housing prices in San Francisco. You know, it's one of the most expensive places to live, truly. Right. And the housing, the housing rise, the prices just keep rising. And there was a statistic that came out just in July that broke my heart. It said that there was a study done that said that over half of all homeless people over the age of 50 became homeless for the first time after their 50th birthday. So imagine your dad or you spending your senior years homeless on the streets for the first time. And the, and the problem that they cited most, the reason they cited most was because of the very high, uh, the very high pricing of houses. Now, from there, once you get on the street, it takes about a year before you start getting involved then in drugs, drug addiction, you know, to keep yourself warm at night or to, you know, numb yourself from the pain of being homeless. And then it's a slippery slope from there. So it's high, it's high housing prices. It is mental illness and it is drug addiction. Those are the three main causes of the, uh, homeless crisis. Do you think rent control is a contributing factor to uh, the homelessness situation? Because I've heard that it actually has negative effects. You know, the intention is to keep the prices down, but it actually sometimes produces negative effects. What do you think? Uh, Yeah, that absolutely could be a a big cause of that, the rent control. Um, Also, the, the zoning laws, you know, it takes a very long time for anyone to actually build anything here in San Francisco because the, the zoning laws are, are so tight and it's extremely expensive to build in San Francisco. So there's, it's hard to find affordable housing here. I know it's a complex question, but what do you think can be done? What can we do to help these people get off the street? Well, there is a, com- it is a complex question. And it's something that I'm, to be honest with you, I'm really still heavily researching and trying to find the solutions to. You know, one of them is to look uh, there's a lot of funding that's going to these nonprofit organizations that are supposedly helping the homeless. But we need to know where is that money going to exactly because the homeless crisis continues to rise. You know, since the last, since 2017, the homelessness, the rate of homelessness has risen 17% in San Francisco alone. And there's over uh, 500, I believe, 500 million that has been spent in the last year on homelessness, quote unquote. So we need to look at these uh, these nonprofits, where are they all going? Is it really going to the homeless crisis or is it going to just quote unquote research uh, and just making other people rich sitting behind uh, sitting behind desks? What is that? What, what, what are they really doing? Number one, and, and can we be allocating those funds better elsewhere? We also need to look at the zoning laws. We need to look at the housing prices. Uh, we need to uh, potentially 
um, get them more into mental health facilities or drug facilities. There are some things that, that San Francisco's are doing to enable homelessness even more, such as the, uh, the free needle exchange program. Um, and the, the programs where you can, the facilities where they can go in and inject drugs or exchange, uh, get, get clean needles. And, and it's a safe space for them to do that instead of doing that on the street. Well, the problem with that is it sounds nice in theory, but it really is, it, it's really just enabling more homelessness because then they feel that there's San Francisco is a welcoming, uh, safe place for them to come, set up camps, um, inject drugs, get free needles. Right. So so those are the things that are actually harming the situation and making it worse. They're getting free needles, but they're not getting free drugs, I assume. Uh, no, but there's an, a, a safe injection spot where they can inject. Uh, they can inject. They do not. I, as far as I know, they are not getting the free drugs, but they can they can get the needles that are clean and uh, a safe space to inject the drugs. So this was uh, to try to cut down the spread of HIV, I assume. With the free needles, that was sort um, right. of the point, you know? and it, yeah. But the thing is, you know, again, when you have um, when you have things like this, you know, you're really just creating more of a welcoming environment for homelessness to come in. Because well, other places that have this, you know, they don't have a, such a high rate of homelessness. You know, we need to, we can be kind, but we also need to uh, stop enabling it. Well, you're right about it being a complex issue because... Building public housing, I don't really think solves the problem. I don't know about you, but I've never been in a public housing facility that was anything mm-hmm. other than crime ridden and basically the same thing going on. You know, it's not a good mm-hmm. environment for people, especially for kids growing up there. Right, right, exactly. So it is a complex, com- a complex problem. It's going to require a complex solution. And I am researching it a lot now, and I don't have the full, complete answers for you yet. Okay. Well, maybe we'll have you back on the show in <laughs> six months, and we yeah. can see how you've progressed. Yeah. The election is, you're going to be the same time as the presidential election, I assume, right? Well, so uh, actually, they've moved up the primary. The primary in California is now March 3rd. Oh, okay. So March 3rd, I will face off with the other, uh, the other challengers to Nancy Pelosi in my district, and from there, they will take the top two. And hopefully, with everyone's support and love and donations, I'll be able to uh, to make the top two. And then I would go into the general election with Nancy Pelosi um, next November. How many other people are running against her? As of now, there are uh, three others besides for myself. All Republican? No, there's one Republican. There's two other Democrats. The other, the Democrats are pretty far left Democrats. The Republican is someone that this is his fourth time running. So he's kind of been there, done that. Um, and, and then there's me, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty strong conservative and a champion for conservative values. And I'm openly pro Trump. I am openly uh, pro wall, anti illegal immigration. Uh, the, the views that I have, you can, you can go to my website, by the way, at Deanna for Congress.com. That's Sienna for Congress.com. The views that I have are really, uh, they're bold and they're solid and they, they're not soft. So what I've noticed is, is there, are, there are a lot of softer conservatives out there who, um, who kind of hide their conservative views and they're not very openly pro-Trump, et cetera. And they may get more, uh, you know, more support from more moderates, but honestly, you know, I'm not going to change my views. I'm not going to change my support of uh, President Trump anytime soon. I'm going to be loud and proud about it. And that will either draw people to me or push them away. And I'm okay with that. Have you had any run-ins with Antifa? Uh, no, they crossed my fingers. But no, I have not had any run-ins with Antifa yet. Oh, that's good. Because, I mean, we yeah, see... Yeah, I have in the past, but not, not yeah. on my campaign trail. But I have definitely in the past when I've spoken at rallies before. There, there are a lot of them that surround these rallies. Uh, that I speak at, you know, the the funny thing is, the ironic thing is, there's a lot of free speech rallies, and Antifa loves to go to them and try to shut them down. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> it's unbelievable. And it's unbelievable that a lot of Democrats out there are still saying that they're this peaceful group. Well, I think a lot of Democrats are, but they've been sort of taken over by this far-left radical 
element. And, you know, I, I hate to think that the average Democrats, particularly in the Rust Belt states, the ones that all flip for Trump, I don't think mm -hmm. they're in line with Antifa and with Bernie Sanders and um, Elizabeth Warren. I really don't. I think they're the old school yeah. Democrats, like the John Kennedy Democrats. They're, I think they're going to be voting for Trump again, to put it simply, because yeah. they just there yeah. is no candidate on in the Democratic side that's going to appeal to them. Right. You know, Hillary completely blew off those people in 2016, and she paid the price. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, you don't just disparage, uh, you know, millions of people in America. You don't just disparage them like that or label them like that or, um, you know, or stereotype them and expect them to want to support you afterwards. You know, Hillary Clinton and so many other Democrats like Kamala Harris and Nancy Pelosi, they think they could shame their way into office. They think they can disparage and shame, uh, you know, at least half of Americans. And somehow they will they will win their support, and that's just we we've proven time and time again that that is not the case. But of course they will never learn. They don't. They haven't learned yet. No, and it doesn't look like they're going to learn this time around. And they seem like they've doubled down on everything that happened yep. from 2016. Yes. Uh, changing the subject yeah. real quick here, I happen to see in the news today that they're shutting off the electricity to about a million people. Somewhere in, uh, mm -hmm. in is it's not quite in your area, right? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, that can't be. I understand that they're doing it for trying to prevent fires because apparently it's very dry at this point. But uh -huh. do you think that's the best solution <laughs> to shut off uh -huh. everyone's electricity? I mean, I would be pissed if they did that. Yeah. Yeah, they said, you know, it's about 800,000 of its customers in California. It's, it's a very interesting solution. I'm not quite sure what to think of it, to be honest with you. Well, I, why can't they bury the lines? Mm -hmm. You know, that just seems like that would be an easier solution. Right. I mean, there's going to be some in San Francisco, San Jose, Sacramento. Um, and, you know, we, I don't know yet. It's not affecting me personally yet. You know, my power has not uh, has not gone out, but... Um, it is going to be almost a million, and it's, I don't know. I really will. I guess we'll see if the solution makes sense or not. Do they know how long these people are going to be without power? I do not. I think they said something around twenty-four hours, but I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Hmm. Well, okay. Let's see. What else you want to talk about? Is this your first venture into running for public office? Yes, this is my first venture. So what? And it, uh, it's an interesting ride so far. Well, tell me a little about it. How did you get to the point where, how does somebody start doing this? Okay, let's say I want to run for public office. What do you do first? I have no idea. Well, you would make a decision. And then you would <laughs> file for the uh, file with the FEC and, uh, and start your committee. And then you would uh, have an exploratory phase. You know, typically people have an exploratory phase and, you know, throw it out there, sort of testing the waters see if they can raise some funds, see if people would be willing to support them and donate to them, and, uh, and if their message resonates and things like that. And then if they're ready to go forward, they would move forward. And you would start, um, you know, obviously create a website. You would, uh, you would start campaigning, start raising funds officially. And, um, yeah, you really just go from there. You have to have a, you want to have a strong message. You want to have a, a message that resonates with people. You want to work with uh, people that connect you, get get a campaign manager, get a whole campaign team, get a ground team going. Okay. How have you been received in San Francisco? Because, I mean, I can't imagine that's Trump land in, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Right. Uh, when you've been yeah. out meeting people and talking to people, what what are their reactions? Well, it's difficult because I am who I am, you know, and I've, uh, uh, I, the, the real conservatives love me and love my message and they are rooting for me and they want me to win. They are, they are so behind me and so excited about the campaign and so excited about what I'm championing. Um, then there's a lot of, you know, obviously the, the district is very blue. So, you know, you get one issue off or two and they just, they won't even talk to you. 
You know, if they if they are just so focused on things like climate change being their number one priority, and that's not number one priority for me, they really don't want to talk to me. If they, you know, if I'm pro life and they're pro choice, it's a, it's going to be a a, no, a non-starter for a lot of these people. Um, if I, um, you know, one thing I'm promoting, which is difficult in San Francisco, is uh, I'm talking about how the schools, the public schools. I, I don't believe that they should be pushing um, this abortion curriculum, uh, sexuality, gender, you know, the, that gender and sexuality curriculum that is being pushed now rapidly in public schools. I really don't think that it's a, a, appropriate. I think that gender, sexuality, and abortion, those kinds of things should be taught by loving parents in the home. I don't think they should be taught by radical teachers at school. And so that, just saying that, is a conversation that that really aggravates a lot of people, especially in San Francisco. They say, "Oh, well, you're just you're, you you hate gays, you you you're homophobe," and that's obviously not true at all. It's just that I can separate, you know, I can I can love everybody, but at the same time feel like certain things are inappropriate to be taught in school. So, you know, I, I get mixed reviews, and when I have strong opinions like that, and anyone has strong opinions, you're going to gravitate people towards you who absolutely love your views. And then you're going to really repel a lot of people. But um, I'm going to keep fighting no matter what. And I'm always open to hearing conversations and listening to other people's points of view, always. And that's what I've been doing a lot of lately, hearing what their views are, talking to them, getting to know them, and seeing what's really important to them, what matters to them. Um, Some of the people, some of the Republicans that are more of the rhinos, you know, the old established Republicans, they also have resistance to me. Because I'm more of an outsider, I'm a political outsider, I have not been entrenched in politics and sitting in Washington the last 40 years, out of touch with Americans, they have like their own little club, and they don't want to rock the boat, they don't want someone who has new, fresh ideas, and is of a younger generation, they want to kind of pass the torch down to someone that's just in their club already. So that's the most resistance that I've been getting. Otherwise, I've just gotten a lot of love and a lot of support for my message and the, the values and policies I'm championing. Well, those old, uh, mm-hmm. the old cronies, uh, they didn't like Trump either. They probably still don't. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. They don't like that I'm pro, that I'm openly pro Trump. They think yeah. I should tone that down. A lot of them even think that the using God, family, and country as my campaign fl- slogan is too bold. And, uh, and you know, these, that's, that's their opinion, but I'm not going to change who I am and what values I champion. Are you a Candace Owens fan? I do like her. Yeah, I think she's. Uh, I think she's got a lot of great ideas, and she's she's a hell of a communicator. Every time I watch something that she does, she just blows me away. I look at her and just mm-hmm. say, "Where have you been? <laughs> yeah. You need. She needs to run for public office. The only the only downside of it is she's very young. I, th- I don't even think she's thirty years old yet. But. She is but that's okay. Fast. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a lot of newcomers that are running for office right now. A lot of Republican women and men, and they're all very young. They're all under age 35. Well, I mean, it's good. It's great. I think it's wonderful because the, the millennium generation needs more conservatives because they seem to be tilted way to the left, most of them. Yep, absolutely. So I'm, I'm a millennial, too, so that's why I think it's even more important to fight for uh, to do have a younger generation, you know, we are left with this mess. You know, we have we, we are left with the mess of a do nothing Congress. So we've got to take the power back and actually fix this mess. You know, it's really up to us, and it's up to the newer generation. I think. Well, we got to wrap this up. What is your website? It's Deanna D E A N N A for Congress dot com. Really check it out. You can get to know me better. There's a lot of videos on there. Um, You will get to know my policies and my full platform, what I'm going to be championing, you know, God, family, country, and, uh, of course, the wall and free speech and jobs. It's it's really exciting stuff. And then please follow me on Twitter, too, if you've got Twitter. I'm Deanna and the number four, Congress. Uh, I I post and tweet a lot on Twitter, and there's, there's a lot of exciting things about my campaign there. Super. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Best of luck. I'll be I watching. appreciate you having me on. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Hi there. This is Stuart Epps, record producer. This is my story about Elton John 
uh, working with him in those early years, going back to 1967 at Dick James, uh, all the amazing tours, those first recordings, uh, going through the Rocket Records, and uh, it's an amazing story about his incredible rise to stardom and my part in that. So uh, look forward to taking you on that journey. So here we go. Yeah, and to order this great audio CD, please just email me at stuartepps at talk21.com. That's Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Epps, E-P-P-S, at talk, T-A-L-K, 21 in figures, dot com. Stuart Epps at talk21.com. Email me and I'll give you all the details for buying this brilliant audio disc. Thank you. Bye. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of the Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro-Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians, and everyone else, to commit to truth-oriented behaviors. The Pledge asks signees to commit to 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows lead to truthfulness, such as clarifying one's opinions and the facts, citing one's sources, and celebrating people who update their beliefs toward the truth. Private citizens who sign the pledge get the benefit of contributing to a more truth-oriented society. Public figures get more substantive rewards for signing the pledge in the form of positive media and public recognition. The pledge crowdsources the truth by asking volunteers to evaluate the statements of public figures who sign the pledge. Take the pledge, demand that your elected representatives do so, and encourage your friends to take it at protruthpledge.org. The Douglas Coleman Show is now offering a complete radio promotional package for music artists. Your track will air 28 times a week for one month over all of our online and terrestrial platforms as well as permanently archive on Spreaker, iTunes, and many other sites. Your profile will also be featured in our Featured Music Artists page on our website. With this package, you will also get a 15-minute interview on our show to promote your latest single, EP, LP, or upcoming gig. Similar packages like this can run hundreds of dollars and often are subscription-based. Our package is a one-time fee of just $49.99. Please go to douglascolemanmusic.com forward slash CRPP. That's douglascolemanmusic.com forward slash CRPP for complete details. Let's work together to get your music heard. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. And now... Hey, Rocky! Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat! Again? Nothing up my sleeve! Presto! <laughs> Ooh, don't know my own strength! Now here's something we hope you'll really like! Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Rick Ness. How are you, Rick? I'm doing great, buddy. How you doing? Doing very well. You are on the show Gold Rush, which is on Discovery, and... Uh, from what it says on your bio here, it's the tenth season. Congratulations to that! Oh, thank you. It's been you, a good run. You're gonna have to kind of do gold mining 101 with me because I I've never seen the show to be honest, and I know nothing okay. about gold mining. So 
maybe give us the premise of the show first, and then I want to ask you a couple of questions about the actual mining itself. Sure. Well, the show follows uh, uh, three uh, claim owners, uh, myself being one of them. Um, I run a, a small mining company uh, up in the Yukon Territory. Um, it's me and uh, uh, nine of my buddies, and uh, we just... Uh, yeah, we uh, mine for gold. We use uh, heavy equipment, you know, excavators, haul trucks, uh, stuff like that, and uh, process it through a wash plant. So the show just follows you guys around and just uh, sort of documents what what happens and what kind of problems you run into, stuff like that? Yeah, exactly. And uh, being in that rem- remote of a location um, and, and running things as hard as we do, I mean, there's uh, pretty much nothing but problems. That's just kind of the nature of the business. So how did you get into this? I actually, uh, well, I used to be a full-time musician, and uh, I ended up playing a show in Alaska, and uh, there was something about Alaska that just spoke to me, and I was trying to find a way to, to spend the summer there. And uh, so I talked to some people, got a job uh, gold mining, and uh, just kind of took off. You know, I just uh, I worked hard at it, really wanted to learn it, and uh, ended up, uh, I ended up running a crew for a guy. His name is Parker. Uh, I was a foreman. I ran his crew, and then uh, last year I decided to go out on my own, and uh, now I've got my own crew. Was this before the show? This all happened during the show. Yeah, I, I started on the show's been the show's in its tenth season. Uh, I started on season three. You start okay. So tell me about gold mining, okay? Because first of all, I know this is going to sound like an ignorant question, but how does one even know where there's any gold? I mean, you could just be digging forever. Oh yeah, you definitely can, and some people do. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> there, it's a it's a very exp- it's a very expensive process, especially if you're not digging in the right place. Uh, there is technology uh, these days to to find it. Uh, we do run like resistivity lines, um, which kind of tells us uh, you know where the bedrock is underneath uh, underneath the ground, um, and then we basically drill and uh, and take core samples and um, you know figure out through that through that process we're able to figure out the right spots to dig okay so is it like oil in the sense where you can kind of see where the gold might be yeah a bit i mean there's nothing that really tells you everything you know um there's nothing that can tell you the complete story um but but by drilling it, it gives you an idea it, it, at least if, if gold comes up in the sample um at least you know there's gold there and then you got to judge um you know according to the sample size um, you know, how much gold is in there, and you can get a rough estimate, um, you know, by the cubic yard, how much gold it's going to yield. Okay. Does anybody know, like, how much gold is left on planet Earth? Is there any idea <laughs> on that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, uh, I, don't, I definitely don't, don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'm hoping there's lots left because I, uh, there's still a lot more <laughs> that I want to find. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, as far as in general, I've never, I've never heard that question asked. That's a good question. Well, you know, like they know kind of how much oil is left in certain areas. Like they can sort of predict how much is still left in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East and under Venezuela and the Alaskan North Shore. They can estimate. But gold, you know, who knows, yeah? Yeah, I I think that's probably right. I mean, there are some, you know, major uh, mining operations all over the world um, that go after ore bodies that they probably know, you know, have a pretty good idea of what's left there and, and what's left to get. But as, as far as the kind of mining that we do, which is called placer mining, uh, which is above ground uh, surface mining, um, I don't think there's, I don't think there is an actual answer to that. Explain what that is. What did you call it? Placer mining? Yeah, placer mining. So we do, uh, we do, pro- we do uh, completely, it's all above ground. Uh, mining, which means we uh, we start at the top and we strip off usually what is called a, a layer of overburden, which is kind of like uh, your organic soils and stuff like that um, that have no gold in it. Um, so you got to get through that, which is an expensive process, and then you get down to you know like the ancient uh, river gravels and or glacier move channels, like I'm going after. Um, you know that were deposited hundreds of thousands of years ago, and uh, and and once you get into that. Um, then you start processing that through a wash plant, and uh, that technology really hasn't changed much. I mean, uh, it has, you know, compared to 100 years ago. But at the end, of, at the end of every wash plant is a sluice box, and sluice boxes have been around since the beginning. So it's uh, that's just uh, there's nothing mechanical about that. It's basically just a chute with some expanded metal ripples in it, and 
since the gold's heavier, the wash, the, the rocks wash out, the gold settles in, and and uh, that's it. That's where it's at at the end of the day. When you go to, like, I've been to gold shops, and I've seen gold bars and things like that for sale. Some yep. of them have different levels of purity. What is the yep. pu- what is the purity of the gold that comes out of the earth? Is that ninety nine point nine nine? Oh, well, it, it varies everywhere. It varies. Um, okay. it, uh, that, oh, yeah, it varies everywhere. Um, uh, like the ground that we're mining uh, right now, uh, my gold comes out. It's, it's primarily about 82% pure um, and has uh, also a silver content of about 17%. And then there's a, a small percentage of a, a bunch of random stuff as well in there. So. so to get it pure, they have to melt that down and then kind of separate out the the non gold from the gold yes sir yep that uh it's called smelting smelting okay like i said yep. i knew absolutely zero about this now you said that yeah. you were a, a musician you went to alaska and yep. was a musician are you, are you originally from alaska no i'm not i i grew up in upper michigan uh and i've lived now i live in wisconsin i've lived there for about 15 years um and yeah i was a uh, a full-time uh, stand-up bass player. I played with uh, kind of a rowdy bluegrass band. Uh, spent eight years touring um, all over the world, and uh, and yeah, that's what kind of ended me lent with in Alaska. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. So, yeah. you would have had a? Did you go to school or something once you got interested in gold mining? I mean, it seems like you know a lot of, about the technical details of it, or is this just what you've gotten from the show? Yeah, this was just kind of first-hand knowledge, um, you know, just learning as I went. Uh, I definitely didn't know anything about it when I got started, um, but with with most things uh, that I, I like to do, I don't I don't really like to do anything, you know, kind of half-ass. Excuse my language. Um, if I'm going to do something, I do it right. Um, so I just I, I applied myself and and uh, you know really became a student of it and and tried to learn it as well as I could. So did the producers of the show pick you for your musical ability or for your ability <laughs> to learn how to be a gold miner? <laughs> they actually had nothing to do with it. It's uh, it's funny that way. So I, I got hired on. Um, I was uh, my first season mining. I, I got hired on by the guy that I was mining for, but I wasn't uh, I wasn't being paid to be on the show or anything. Um, I I happened to. May, uh, be on the show and then they decided they liked me and then uh you know the uh then it just went from there now i'm reading through this yep. uh bio that your pr people sent me is this kind of a competition between you guys i mean like is that sort of the premise of the show they're going to see who's going to get the most and who's going to have the least amount of trouble like like i said i'm i apologize for never seeing the show but i don't even have the discovery channel yeah. so um, yeah, yeah, no worries. It's uh, no worries. Yeah, it is a bit um, of a competition, I guess you could say. Um, not so much with me. Um, I'm kind of a newcomer as far as starting my own business, um, and I've only been at it for two years, so I, I don't have the the kind of infrastructure and in the in the background and the capital um, to really go large scale like the the two other guys on the show. So I, I'm kind of in a uh, in a smaller league by myself. I uh, I kind of like it that way. How much gold have you taken out so far? Well, uh, my first year on my own, um, we we did well over a million dollars worth of gold our, our first season, which was actually uh, a record for a, a rookie crew on Gold Rush. Wow. Do you get to keep that? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, good. So it doesn't go to the Discovery Channel and they give you a percent. You get no. Everything you find, you get to keep, yeah. right? Oh, that's oh cool. yeah. Well, a lot of it, most of it goes to bills. I mean, like I said, it's an expensive process. So it's, uh, you know, we're we're out there. It's, you know, you're writing fifty thousand dollar checks to the fuel company for diesel fuel every month. They, they, the the money doesn't go a whole long ways. <laughs> the profit margins are small. Wow. How about those guys that were up there? You know, like a hundred and fifty years ago. How did they even have a? I mean, like you were talking about. Now we've got the technology, and you've got heavy machinery and stuff. What were these guys doing? You know, the uh, minor 49er types. Were they just using dynamite yeah. and and pans and sieves and that's it? Yeah, I, I really, that was, a, that was a whole other breed back then. Um, you know, those guys are way tougher than any of us today. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I've often wondered the same thing. Like, you know, now there's roads and stuff like that up there and, you know, and there's claims that are that are kind of laid out and drilled, but 
back then, I, I have no idea how they decided, you know, like big here, dig there. It, it's just, uh, it's really mind blowing to be honest with you. Well, I know some of them did like, they would go into the river, right? And they would take their, uh, yeah. what is that thing called with the screen on the, is it a sieve? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Sieves. Yeah. They'd have sieves and, and pans. Yep. Pan. Okay. Panning for gold. Right. Yep. And then yep. I guess if they found gold in the stream, they would assume that it was coming from upstream somewhere. And yep. I don't know, try to find the source, I guess. But God, talk about looking yeah. for a needle in a haystack. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, and that back at those times, you could actually find lots of it, like you said, in streams and rivers and on the surface. Um, but all, all of that stuff's long gone. <laughs> oh, I bet it is. So gold has recently yeah. shot up about three hundred dollars an ounce in the last what four yep. months or so. Yep. I suspect it's going to continue with all of the turmoil in Washington yep. and the uncertainties. You know, I mean, th this is not big news that anytime there's political uncertainty, gold always goes up. The trade war in China. Yep. Certainly, that's beneficial for you, right? The higher the price goes. It, does it affect oh, yeah. your bottom line, or is that the same? You just get more for your return. Oh, I mean that 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 affects everything for sure. I mean uh, that, like you said, that 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 raise in prices is helping me immensely right now. And if it continues to go up, then uh, then all the better. Because, like I said, uh, you know, even where it was at last year, um, you know, about three hundred bucks an ounce less. I mean, the the margins at that point are getting so so tight. You know, that heavy equipment's expensive, the fuel's expensive, the, the employees are expensive, and it's all, you know, if, if the price of gold keeps going up, then it just, uh, yeah, it just increases the profit, which is, uh, you know, kind of, the, kind of the, the, the priority there. How many guys do you have working for you again? Me, I have nine. Nine guys. Okay, so you got to pay them, yep. right? Yep. <laughs> okay. They're not there for free. <laughs> Um, and then you just li you live out there, or do you have a house, or how does this work? I, I picture you guys all living in a, like a camp or something. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, camp. There's no uh, there's no permanent structures allowed out there. It's uh, everything's got to be uh, movable. So we have uh, like I have like a commercially built uh, uh, five unit uh, camp structure that that uh, that's mobile. Uh, it's on skids, so it can be trailered, um, and then they all they all go. Uh, they all go together when you, when you put them in one spot. It's actually not so bad. I mean, it's not for everybody, um, but it's clean, it's dry, it's warm, and uh, there's always good food. I'm picturing something like a trailer, like just a mobile home kind of place. Is it like that? or? Is yep, it, very you know? similar. Yeah, similar, except, uh, you know, m mounted on a skid so it can be drug around or loaded onto a trailer, and then uh, just kind of more commercially built uh, for, the, for the surroundings, like tougher for like a job site, you know what I mean? So in case of high wind, it's not going to just blow away. Yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> well, you know, that's the old classic about why do tornadoes always touch down in trailer parks? Yeah, yeah. easy prey. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy prey, exactly. <laughs> now, do you guys work all year, or do you just work in the summer? Because I'm sure it gets pretty cold up there. Oh, yeah, it's definitely got a season uh, from April till about uh, till about now, actually. That's why I'm, I just left there uh, currently, because it's, uh, yeah, it gets... Uh, regularly it gets below, uh, you know, minus 50 in the wintertime there. So that's uh, it's no place to be. So what do you do during the wintertime? Uh, catch up on all the sleep that I don't get in the summertime <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> do you stay up there or do you go back to Michigan or what? Oh, yeah, no, I don't stay up there at all. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm out of there right now. I'm actually in New York uh, doing some, some media stuff for the show, and uh, I'll be heading back to my house in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. All right, great. Well, I think we've covered everything. Anything else you want to mention before we wrap it up? Uh, no, I don't think so, other than the fact that the Season 10 starts uh, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern on Discovery. Yes, sir. Yep. All right. Do you have a personal website or anything you want to give out in case people want to come check you out? Yeah, I mean, I've got the, I've got the usuals. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you can find me. It's uh, usually Gold Rush Rick. Gold Rush Rick. Okay, and that's that's on Twitter, Facebook. Yep, all those. Okay, all right. Well, Rick, thanks a lot for coming on. Appreciate your time. Best of luck with the show. And uh, I have to see if I can get the Discovery Channel. Are you online at all? I mean, is this show? 
Yeah, it actually, you can stream it as well on, on Discovery Go, it's called. Oh, all right. Maybe I'll check it out. Got to see this now. Uh-huh. You got me You got me curious about all this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Rick. It's a good take, show. Yeah, take care. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Hi, this is John Morgan, production supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show.
Sunday afternoon And once we were told You're not always in tune Now you're in the pain Right on the top A good horse in the state That train never stops I'm coming down, coming down Like a feather I'm coming down, coming down To see Sunday afternoon And once we were talking Sure not always in tune
that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guests, Deanna Lorraine and Rick Ness. Also, thank you to Frantic Planet, Rio Glacier, and the Como Brothers for their music. This is Douglas Coleman saying, I'll see you later. Do that, man.